All right, we are right at two o'clock. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and get us um, started because we have a, a really great, interesting program today. So we wanna have plenty of time um, for Dr. Frank to present. So um, I am just gonna introduce everything and then I will pass things over to him and um, we'll get going. So um, just good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Modern by Tradition, Innovation and the Transfer Transformation of Seminole Culture with Dr. Andrew Frank. I'm Katie Kelly, the Special Programs Coordinator at the Orange County Regional History Center. Our organization is located in downtown Orlando, and we offer three floors of permanent exhibitions, renowned special exhibitions from the Smithsonian, and a variety of interactive, unique experiences and programs for guests of all ages. While the History Center is partially funded by Orange County, donations to the Historical Society of Central Florida are vitally important to the center's ability to serve the community and continue to fulfill our mission to serve as the gateway for community engagement, education, and inspiration by preserving and sharing Central Florida's continually unfolding story. Donations allow for the care and upkeep of the historic collection, presentation of special exhibitions, and offering innovative programs. I've, I'm going to go ahead and put a link after I'm done introducing here. I'm going to put a link in the chat um, for anyone that is interested in more information about how you can support the museum and the historical society. Um, just again for everyone, today's program is being facilitated as a webinar, so that means that attendees do not have access to your video and audio. We will save some time at the end for questions, so please feel free to put any questions that you have for Dr. Frank in the chat as they come to you throughout the program. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, we'll address those at the end, but you don't need to wait until the end um, when... Um, Dr. Frank is presenting. I'll actually be pulling the questions out and then I'll pop back on and facilitate the question and answer. So um, please feel free to do that at any point. This program today is the fourth installment of our Joseph L. Breckner speaker series for the spring. This year, our series theme is Becoming Florida as we mark the bicentennial of Florida becoming a U.S. territory in 1821. Our next installment will take place on Sunday, May 30th, and we'll be joined by Dr. Uzi Barham, who will be discussing the ethnogenesis and archaeology of the freedom-seeking peoples known as the Black Seminoles. Um, so without any further ado, I am happy to introduce today's presenter. Andrew K. Frank is a specialist in the history of the Seminoles in Florida. He is the Alan Morris Professor of History at Florida State University and an award-winning author and editor of many books and articles, including uh, Before the Pioneers, Indian Settlers, Slaves, and the Founding of Miami, and The Seminole, The History and Culture of Native Americans. He is currently finishing a book-length manuscript titled Those Who Camp at a Distance, The Seminoles and Indians of Florida, which is a synthesis of the history of the Seminoles and their origin until the present. So um, without any further ado, I'm gonna let Dr. Uh, Frank hop on here. I'm going to mute myself, turn off my camera and he'll take it over from here. Thank you, Mary. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for taking time out of their Sunday um, to listen to me talk about one of my favorite topics, which is not just a Seminole tribe, but this idea of modernity and tradition. Um, as it turns out, I was spending my morning or a good chunk of my morning reading an essay question that my undergraduates are tackling with right now. And the question that I asked them, and it's kind of a question that we're gonna explore a little bit today, which is why is it that non-natives often look across into Indian country and when they see Native Americans looking distinctive, either eating foods that look different or wearing clothing that look different, the presumption is that that is a holdover from ancient times, from what, like the time before memory, something older than dirt, um, rather than a modern innovation. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a handful of ways in which the Seminole tribe of Florida are both modern and traditional at the same moment, in the same act. Um, and I don't think that this is necessarily peculiar to the Seminole tribe. People who've looked at the Narragansett or looked at the Navajo or other indigenous people, they too, um, recognize that modernity and tradition are um, complementary, not necessarily contradictory. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen and we will go from there. Um, that way you can see some lovely pictures and don't have to pay attention to me so much. All right, let me start this up. So let me just start here. The, this idea that the Seminoles in particular are an unconquered remnant of the past 
um, is not new. This is something um, I grew up in Broward County. Um, my father worked in Hollywood, basically maybe a half mile or a mile from the edge of the Seminole Reservation. I knew Seminoles were there, kind of. Um, but I can remember as a kid taking a tour on the Jungle Cruise and seeing alligator wrestling um, and looking at um, young men and women wearing patchwork clothing. And I was led to believe, although I don't think anyone ever said it, that I was looking at kind of like a time capsule, that somehow this was how Seminoles looked, act, behaved, and talked a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 years ago. And this idea that traditional behavior and maybe we can call it distinctively indigenous behavior is timeless. Um, and I wanna give you a different way of understanding it, but rather to think of it as indigenous innovation is hidden behind a distinctive path of development. In other words, um, we or myself, I'm accustomed to understanding how say the culture in the United States develops and like the way in which styles change or music changes or what expectations in literature are and they have been changing and I acknowledge that that is changing and there's a path that goes on. Seminoles have a very similar type of process going on but the rules and the manner by which these innovations take place are different. So a modern version of clothing for the Seminoles may have elements of what looks like something I would recognize or I might wear but it is put together in a grammar or a, uh, a trajectory that is tied to a distinctive path. Um, so we see something that is distinctive, we perceive it as different and therefore we imagine it as being old rather than new. Um, but if we turn back the clock only whatever 80 years in 1941 during the Great Depression, the United States sent these writers all over the country to tell the history of all sorts of people and do all sorts of interviews. And Stanley Hansen did one for the Indians of Florida or the history of Florida. And he wrote about the native people who are here. And he writes, the big Cypress Indians still live as they have for centuries, for the most part, untouched and unspoiled by civilization, asking nothing from the white man except to be left alone. And on one hand, he's 100% right. The Seminoles at Big Cypress and the Miccosukees at Big Cypress, the Miccosukee speakers, they repeatedly said, leave us alone. But at the same time, they repeatedly reached out to traders for goods that they desired. They didn't want to be untouched. They wanted to control the way in which the touching, if you will, took place. They wanted to be masters of their own destiny. They wanted to be in control over their own culture. And for the history of, of these particular peoples in South Florida, that has largely been the case. So now if we pass forward to the 2000s, um, here's a quotation that's probably closer to the perspective that we're going to get today. Um, this is by Pedro Cepeda, a tribal member, citizen, and employee, um, writing on a blog at the Atatiki Museum, the Seminole Tribes Museum. He writes, although some of the traditional arts have changed little over time, many others have. 150 years ago, Seminoles were using European metal tools to create canoes and stickball sticks. So today it is no surprise to see Seminoles using chainsaws and plastic clamps alongside hatchets and draw knives. I've always liked to say that we are modern by tradition and so it remains today. In other words, in this case, the dugout canoe may look similar but the process by which it was put together um, obviously is being done now with modern tools. In other cases, we're gonna see that the tradition itself, the act itself changes or the use of the canoe changes. So for today, I'm going to quickly go through five different kind of traditions, clans, food, one particular type of food, what, how they dress, where they live, and I think my favorite alligator wrestling. So let's start with the origin story. Seminoles today, not all, but many Seminoles, and on the, if you go to the Seminole Tribes uh, website, or if you go to their museum, they tell a version of the story uh, which I'm not going to tell in full, but it goes something along the lines of once upon a time, all the animals were in a shell on the top of a mound with the master of breath, the great creator, and the wind was circling and ultimately the, the shell cracks open and the clans come out in the or, or the animals come out in the order of their clan. And here's an illustration of the current eight clans, otter, bear, snake, panther, big town, bird, deer, and wind. Um, 
and all members of Seminole society historically um, were members of clan. They took their clan from their mother. Um, women would marry a man from a different clan, but still the kids would take on their clans from their mother. And this is how they structure society. And indeed, every member of the Seminole tribe is free to kind of retell that story, often putting their own clan as the clan coming out first, sometimes putting attributes like patience or strength into the hands or into the embodiment of particular, um, in particular clans. But it feels like this is that origin story, like the Genesis story out of the Bible. Once upon a time, we lived in a shell on the top of a mound it cracked open and we came out in the order of our clan. Um, it feels like it is what one scholar calls back to the time before memory. But we know some Seminoles descend from the Creeks. And in the 1770s, the Creeks um, repeatedly told a story to outsiders that in the time before memory, all the animals were hidden from each other, not in a shell, but what they call the great fog. The wind cleared the fog and the various clans came to know one another. It's similar, but it's certainly not the same, um, right? The, the difference between a fog and a shell is, is distinctive. In North Florida, a couple generations later, um, indigenous folks say the world was created by the great spirit. He formed three men, an Indian, a white and a black man. The Indian was the most perfect. They were called into his presence and directed to select their employments. The Indian chose a bow and arrow, the white man a book, and the Negro a spade. Now, this is a very different type of origin story. This is not about trying to imagine where do clans and families come from, but rather trying to explain in the 1820s the order of things in the American South. North Florida in 1824, right before Indian removal, but after the first Seminole War, trying to explain slavery and differentials in, say, technology. But this is an origin story that's, that's, that's different. By 1900, Seminoles in Big Cypress and Brighton, kind of the two largest um, now reservations, but big communities um, right near Lake Okeechobee, they talked about there being 47 clans, not eight. There wasn't a big town clan. They talked about a Negro clan in one version coming out of the shell last. I hope you can imagine as they're telling stories to explain where they come from and how to structure their world, they're not immune to trying to explain the presence of contemporary realities. If in an indigenous community of African-American citizens or residents or the enslaved, depending on the time period or the community, they're trying to find a way to tell stories and give explanations that are true to tradition, yet also explaining the needs of the present. By 1973, different origin stories are being told by equally authentic Seminole members. This is Elizabeth Billy in 73 in an oral um, testimony that is held at the University of Florida in their library. There really is no difference between what the Bible says and what the Indians used to tell. There just isn't too much difference at all, she said. Just that the people were multiplying, you know, and the flood and the story in the flood and Babylon where the languages were changed. So here's now post um, kind of the conversion or of, of many, not all, but many um, seminals to Methodist and Baptist religions or, or sects, um, they start trying to figure out how do we explain our understanding of where we come from within this new cosmology that we now believe to be true. Um, and things start merging together. So now if we come up to the present, and we go to the story that I started with, which is the story that's told at the Atafiki Museum, um, told at the Green Corn Ceremony, Annalie, often told to elders, to children. Um, I've had members of the tribe come to my class, and that's a story that they often tell. But now it's told inside Methodist and Baptist churches alongside biblical stories. It is true. It is as true as any story. It is as true as, and but believed to be structural in the way in which seminals often understand where they come from. Once upon a time, we came out of the shell in the order of our clan and we're on top of a mound and it has been so ever since. Um, that this story may not be primordial, um, 
but we'll never know whether this is the story that was told by some hundreds of years ago and was never recorded. But that distinction is, is a distinction without a difference. What we do know is that Seminoles have told and have changed and have altered stories um, throughout their history much the same way that all cultures have changed and reinterpreted their stories to make them usable, understandable, and comprehensible um, by the children or their peers or their elders that they're talking to. So let me talk about a, a second one. Um, I wish I could see um, facial expressions, um, but we're gonna go on. So one of the foods that Seminoles have eaten um, and indigenous Floridians have eaten for hundreds of years is called kunti. Um, you can go to Whole Foods today, you can go to Instacart and probably order some because it is like gluten-free and it's natural and it's indigenous to Florida um, or at least parts of Florida. It's often called zamia um, and it is a plant that actually grows at FSU. Um, and if you pull the plant up and pull out the roots, they're kind of these tubular large um, bulbs, if you will, though technically they're not bulbs, but if you grind them into a mash and you strain it out and then you soak it and let the waters come through, um, the poisons that are naturally in it that will make you rather sick all disappear. And in the end, you are left after multiple strains and after loss of washing, you are left with an edible starch. And the starch can be mixed again now with water um, and turned into a bread. If it's fried, it might puff up. Um, and in the 1880s, when Clay Macaulay, representing the Smithsonian, comes to Florida to look at the Seminoles, he says, and he concludes, in the past, Seminoles lived a happy, carefree life, migrating from place to place, the men hunting alligators, while the women could gather the kunti. He imagines them eating this food that is, for lack of a better word, distinctive. And the only explanation he has for it is that this is a holdout from the past. The community that Clay Macaulay visited were almost all exclusively former Creeks. Not all Seminoles descend from the Creeks in Georgia, North Florida, and Alabama, but this community that he visited, he spent most of his time with Muscogee Creek speakers. And these were not folks who were living in Florida for very long. Um, generations earlier, they would have been corn growers. Um, but by 1971, this idea that Kunti is as old as the dinosaurs for Seminole culture um, made it into Bob Mitchell's interview, um, someone who's in charge of Indian affairs. If white man hadn't come in, he hadn't destroyed the planting of the Kunti, those wild zamia they make their bread out of, right? This is the idea that once upon a time, Seminoles had this Edenic world and then white man came in and made it impossible for them to plant kunti. Now, kunti is not planted, it's, it's grown wild. It is kind of possible with modern technology to replant kunti plants, but for the most part, Seminoles were going to wild kunti fields, harvesting them, keeping the small bulbs there and returning year two, three, four, four later. But again, this idea that kunti is this ancient tradition is something that is held pretty hard and fast outside of seminal communities. But when we ask scientists, where does zamia or kunti naturally grow? It's pretty rare. It grows along the southeastern coast of Florida and a little bit in what is now like North Georgia and, and, and the Carolinas, but not much. The interior of Florida where most Seminoles were living in the 1880s, it simply did not grow. They had to travel to go get it. Where most Creeks lived, the ancestors of the folks that Clay Macaulay was talking to, it didn't grow at all. They, grew, they were in like what is now Columbus or Tallahassee. Um, this was a learned behavior, probably learned from the Tequesta and the Calusa, but mostly Tequesta who, who lived here beforehand. Um, and then so the, the Kesta taught these newcomers, and then it becomes a tradition. It is a coastal thing. And indeed, when we look at the writings of U.S. soldiers who record what they destroyed in the various camps as they were raising villages during the Second and Third Seminole Wars, we learn that the production of Kunti, um, the not the machines, the artifacts that you would have used to grind it, really large mortar and pestle, like that picture of that hollowed out tree, those were not things that were being described at all. But instead by the 1880s and even 1920s, Kunti is a learned tradition 
not a primordial one. Um, it's not something done to conserve the past. It is an act of progress in order to preserve themselves in the present. So here's a third one. So I hope we're getting the, the, the idea that we're going to try to imagine seminal culture in motion, not as being fixed, but something that is changing, um, not because outsiders say you must change. This is not the story of boarding schools where native people had their hair forcibly cut and their language is prohibited from being spoken. These are acts that Seminoles or indigenous Southerners choose for themselves because they see it as a means to an end or an improvement or something better according to their own aesthetic. Um, not as an abandonment of culture, but as a preservation of culture. And I'm gonna start with our understanding of clothing with Osceola, um, in part because we have two wonderful pictures of him and his dress is pretty, pretty typical of how seminal men um, were portrayed in portraits and other sketches in the 1820s and 1830s. You can look pretty closely. He has an ostrich feather in his hair. He has a turban around his neck. Um, he has metal wrapped around his chest. He has a sash across um, going from left to right. He has a belt, long sleeves. It looks like a very long skirt, which is called a, lo a long shirt. Um, boots that are really colorful and a rifle. Um, I hope when you look at this, you realize that some of these artifacts or some of these parts of his costume or his clothing um, are not of indigenous origin, but they're put together in a way that certainly are. The metal around his neck, the rifle around in his hand and the boots that he are, is wearing. Now for that matter, the cloth that his long shirt is made from are all imported goods. Um, but had he walked dressed like that into Savannah or into Tallahassee or into Fort King or into any other Anglo or US site, no one would have thought that he was blending in. He may have been wearing items of European origin, but they were put together according to say an accent or a grammar that was distinctively native or indigenous. By the 1890s, this is Clay Macaulay again, this is not what he sees. Instead he sees this, in the camps I saw but one Indian wearing leggings. He is in every way peculiar amongst his people and is objectionably favorable to the white man and the white man's ways. He is called by the white man Key West Billy having received this name because he once made a voyage in a canoe out of the Everglades and along the line of the Keys south of the Florida mainland to Key West. In other words, this gentleman wearing the turban on your left is Key West Billy. And according to Clay Macaulay, holy cow, everything that he is wearing, he has bought in the Keys. And he is objectionable because he is so favoring trade, the white man's ways. Um, because most of the rest of the community are, are dressed differently. Here's a woman much more simply dressed, although she's wearing um, hundreds of strands of beads around her neck, or at least dozens of, of strands of beads. But here's Key West Billy not wearing leggings, wearing what looks like pants, wearing shoes. Um, but in my mind, I look at Key West Billy and I still kind of feel like he is going to the Keys not to dress like someone new but perhaps trying to dress closer to how Osceola would have dressed. Replace the gun, excuse me, with his cane. He still has a long shirt. He still has the metal around his neck. He still has the sash, he still has the turban. Um, by 1910, Seminoles are still fully engaged in trade, but they are still fully engaged in trade and not acting like they want to blend in. This is not acts of assimilation that leads this gentleman on the lower right to buy a bowler hat, um, right? This is, this is not assimilation. This is, this is an attempt um, to look as distinctly seminal as they can and yet change and alter one appearance to look more seminal, not less seminal. So they try new hats and feathers and colors and fabrics and designs and when they get the Singer sewing machine, as we'll see, they become more elaborate in what they're wearing, not so they can assimilate to a non-native norm, but so they can continue the process of innovating um, according to the grammar of what their own expectations are. So 
in the 19, late 19 teens, early 1920s, the Seminoles get the Singer sewing machine. First it's hand cranked, eventually electric. And with this, they create a distinctive form of clothing called Seminole patchwork. And it can be gorgeous and absolutely intricate and it can take hours upon hours to create, but it is not done to look assimilated. It is done as a marker of what it means to be seminal in the modern world. And so in the 2020s, they can go to what Michael's or they can go onto Amazon and they can order whatever fabrics they want. But the net result is not something that is on, I don't think, the Michael's how to create your shirt or skirt or jacket. Instead, it is coming straight out of seminal culture. So here are three different images of what Seminoles wore. On the left, you have Osceola, he, um, or someone for him, purchased a piece of cloth, um, maybe even purchased the entire item, and then cinched it at the waist and added boots and a rifle and a sash across the chest and a belt across the waist and the, and the, and the turban. That is a traditional Seminole form of dress. In the middle, we have the 19 teens, 1920s, where the cloth is stripped on top of one another. It's applied one on top of the other. If you see more than one color in the same place, it's because the, the fabric is two layers thick or three or four layers thick. With patchwork, it's only one layer thick, small pieces of cloth intricately sewn together. Three different forms of seminal tradition um, or one seminal tradition that has indeed I don't know, mutated, changed, improved um, over time. In the 21st century, traditions continue to evolve. They are certainly interacting with outsiders. They are embracing new styles, new ideas, new everything, but putting them together in a distinctively seminal way. At the Seminole Arts and Music Festival, they have every year a modern traditional attire. Um, so in other words, they imagine that the idea of modernity and tradition not are as contradictions, but it's something that when you mash them together, you can create something that is pretty awesome. Um, this is Junior Miss Seminole Tribe and Miss Seminole Tribe. Um, and they receive those awards in part, not totally, because their mother and their aunts create remarkably elaborate costumes that are embraced as the cutting edge of what Seminole patchwork can be. Um, and in the middle, we have a tribal um, councilman wearing blue jeans and a really intricate and beautiful seminal jacket, right? These are all what embraced as what Seminole should be wearing in the traditional way. Now here's just random photos. Um, so on your left-hand side, this is a program I did maybe seven, eight years ago with the Florida Humanities Council. And that's Victor Billy with the sunglasses and he's chanting for his wife and daughter um, a traditional um, dance that would have been chanted at green corn ceremony. And they were demonstrating for everyone in the room what it would have looked like. There was only, only two people who were dancing, but they wanted to see what the stomp would actually look like, what it would sound like. And around their ankle, they had milk cans filled with dried beans. So you can hear the rattle. And it was quite beautiful. And Victor Billy's wife told the audience that historically they used to use turtle shells for it. Um, but they discovered that the milk cans made a similar but nicer sound and they were easier to come by. Doesn't mean that this dance is less authentic. This is just how it is contemporarily done. And now also you can look at in terms of the dress, um, the patchwork shirt with a pair of shorts and a pair of shoes and a watch and a necklace and a pair of sunglasses. This is the modern world and the traditional world merging together um, remarkably comfortably. Um, the bottom right, that is um, a chairman uh, many years ago with then Governor Christ, right? Somehow the cowboy hat becomes part of a traditional attire as well. All right, fourth example. Um, I hope we're getting it. Maybe this is becoming repetitive, but I hope we can imagine that seminal cultures not being fixed is something that is really important. In 1835, the US military drew this sketch of what a seminal village looked like in 1835, and they described each of these constructions as a chiki, which is simply a Muscogee Creek word for house. And if you look closely, some of them are raised off the ground. The one in the bottom left is either unfinished or it has no walls. Most have doors or windows. Most have looks like lumber on the side. 
Um, hard to tell their roofing, but they don't quite look thatched because um, the roofs stop at the eave, except for the one in the very front. By the 1880s, chickies take on a very different perspective. Um, these are from North Florida. These are from the center of the state, much closer to Lake Okeechobee. And the bigger picture that you have here from Macaulay became the standard by which all chickies ultimately got judged. Raised floors, open walled thatched roof made out of cypress logs, not using nails. There's a floor there. Um, you can see that there's a bag hanging from one of the rafters, probably made out of cheesecloth to keep the food away from alligators or to keep it dry. There's some tools around there. Um, it looks like there may be something to make kunti in the bottom right hand corner, a large mortar and pestle. But that becomes like what a chicky is supposed to be. And indeed, lots of outsiders and sometimes seminal say this is kind of the, the definition of a chicky. Um, when they built a couple of chickies at a uh, water area near FSU and at the president's house, this is the model that they followed. Um, and indeed, in the Tri-County area of South Florida, the Seminoles and Miccosukees can build these chickies, and they are, by definition, up to hurricane standards. Um, but the chickie itself takes many forms, or Seminole houses took many forms. In 1879, fundamentally the same time that Macaulay is describing the, chick the chicky around Lake Okeechobee, this is Chepko's house in 1879. Door, lumber, nails. They're both chickies. It's not that in 1879 they did it this way and in 1887 they did it this way. These were contemporaneous, but the idea was what you see here must be the ancient way, and this must be the modern way, ancient, modern. But then what do we do with this? Because these are the chickies in the 1830s. No need to have the open walled thatched roof homes or no need to create them in what is now Tallahassee. Um, as you get closer to what is now the Everglades, and the wetlands and the big cypress swamp, um, the temporary home on the bottom for hunting, the materials used to create what is on the left, that slowly becomes the norm. And this um, may actually be a holdout of tradition rather than a modern innovation. And then we move to the 1930s and 1940s, and we can see all sorts of innovations on the bottom right. You can see the attempt to use corrugated metal and tap into electric lines. You can see a Coca-Cola refrigerator. Um, but if any of you have spent any time in Florida anywhere where you have a metal roof and it is raining, um, it is gonna get incredibly hot and remarkably loud and it can be also remarkably dangerous. So the innovation attempt to use metal probably was a one-time uh, mistake, um, but it lasted for quite a long time. And then in the 20th century, in 21st century, late 20th, early 20th century, Seminoles started putting chickies in their backyards. Um, not only do they create Seminole chicky um, companies, but Seminoles themselves, as they live in cinder block constructed homes um, on reservation, they still want what chickies can provide, but they, put, they do so in their backyards um, in various means or at their recreation areas or in their schools, um, outdoor communal areas where people can meet and greet um, and enjoy one's company. All right, finally, let's talk about alligator wrestling, kind of the last way of understanding this change over time. Um, indigenous Floridians have never wrestled alligators, right? That's a kind of a euphemism, um, but they have hunted alligators and trapped alligators and therefore had to be in close interaction with alligators for a very long time. As tourist attractions began to emerge in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, we're not 100% sure how it started, but it's clear that some construction workers creating Tamiami Trail, um, they watched Seminoles who had alligators tied up um, in their little camps as they were building the road going through, and a Seminole man or woman would tap the alligator on the mouth, um, and the tail would go wagging, and they liked it, um, and it's clear that they paid in some instances for the Seminoles to do a little bit more than that. 
But by 1910, something much more elaborate um, had emerged. Um, at tourist sites throughout South Florida, but especially Miami, um, but also elsewhere, there were various pay-per-view performances where some men would go in, and sometimes women, but almost, almost all of them were men. They would go into the pin and at these villages where non-natives paid to, to watch. Um, they watched them do a series of performances. They would open mouths. They would clamp the mouths closed with one hand. They would sit on the back. If they open it up really, really wide, they would call it the, the Florida smile. Some would even like put their hand inside the mouth waiting for the alligator to, to snap down and make sure their hand is out of there in enough time. They knew what they were doing. There were very few accidents. There were some, um, but this was a means for Seminoles to make money. But to do so, they had to make it seem like this is something that they've always done. Their acts had to be perceived as timeless and immemorial. By the 1960s and 70s, alligator wrestling started taking a back seat, especially in the 80s, to at first um, cigarette sales and then bingo, and then eventually gaming. Um, Seminole men still wrestled alligator, but the desire of outsiders to pay for it and Seminoles to do it for outsiders kind of went away. Um, in the last decade, there have been attempts to revive alligator wrestling, make it an organized sport, allow non Seminoles to do it. And one of the most interesting things for me is that as Seminoles watched, they are enjoying, um, not criticizing, the way in which new alligator wrestlers are creating new techniques and new tricks. They're not wrestling alligators to do it the same way that their great grandfather or great grand uncle did it. They're doing it because, right, they want to see what the next thing can be. Frank Bowers, who is president of the Seminole Board of Directors, isn't anymore, because we're seeing a lot of these advanced techniques. We never did these tricks 50 years ago. So this really old tradition, old meaning 100 years old, um, has never had a moment where it was fixed and, 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 and the same. All these things fly in the face of how outsiders imagine indigenous people supposed to be, or seminals, what they are supposed to be, right? Here are two widely disseminated postcards and photographs. Um, on the upper right, the contrast between the airplane and the seminals are supposed to be clear. The modern world, the national airliner over the Florida Everglades. Um, on the bottom is even, I think, more explicit. Lands now being reclaimed, richest soil in the world, deep mucks, big crops, year-round season. Along with both of these images came the idea that when the Everglades is drained, the Seminoles will disappear. That when the Everglades are gone, the Seminoles or Miccosukees can't exist anymore. Uh, that they are remnants of the past. Um, but I hope we know that's not true. This idea, though, comes from this idea of evolutionary anthropology. We often imagine when we think of first world, second world, third world, we don't, take, we don't tend to use those terms anymore because it came out of this idea that societies were supposed to or expected to develop in particular stages. And if that's the case, if you are a third world country or a primitive country and you become modernized, that means you have acculturated or you've been exterminated. You can't be there anymore. An article in the Field of Stream in 1901 said, with the depletion of the game, their livelihood is being taken from them and they're becoming a helpless people. Without hunting, they can't survive. The commissioner of Indian Affairs, John Collier, who was a progressive who believed in um, the virtues of cultural diversity in the United States under FDR, wondered whether it was appropriate to allow the Seminoles to change. Is it our duty to civilize the Seminoles? I deeply doubt the wisdom of schooling the Seminoles let English come, in other words, if they go to school, that kingly confidence, that radiant reality, which is their life in the wild, might grow less, might fade away. An assimilated, modern, seminal, or a seminal who speaks English, according to Collier, becomes an inauthentic, fake seminal. But Pedro Cepeda tells us otherwise. Um, and I think the history of the Seminole tribe have shown us otherwise. Although some of the traditional arts have changed a little over time, many others have. I've always liked to say that we are modern by tradition and it remains so today.
So that's what I, what I hope we can imagine. That's kind of a five pronged kind of framework to understand how we can see seminal distinctive traditions changing over time, maintaining their distinctiveness or their element of not looking like what exists on outside of their community, but changing over the course of time. And in that way, we can understand how a modern people can also be a traditional people. Um, and I hope I left plenty of time for some questions um, and I'm open to pretty much anything. Yeah, so um, we do have uh, time for questions. I have a few that will get us kicked off with that people have already submitted. Um, anybody else, if you still wanna submit a question, please feel free to do that while we're covering the questions that have already been submitted. Um, just go ahead and put anything uh, you wanna ask Dr. Frank in the chat. Um, thank you, Dr. Frank, for that. Very interesting. So I will just, um, I'm just going to go in the order that we received the questions. Um, so the first one we received, um, Anne asks, I'm wondering if Dr. Frank has read A Land Remembered, and if so, what he thinks of the portrayal of the Seminoles in that novel. Wow, you went right to it. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to answer it in two different ways. It has probably been five or six years since I've read it, so my memory is now on the specifics is a little too hazy. But I would say this, I'm gonna, um, almost every time I tell people I study Florida history and every time I tell them I study Florida history and Seminoles in particular, someone asks me, have I read it? Normally they don't ask me what I think of it. Normally they tell me, um, have you read it? It's the most important book I've ever read. It changed my view of the world and they are effusive in praise for it. Um, there is a pretty large group of scholars of Seminoles who um, want us to imagine this as the land misremembered. Um, Seminoles appear remarkably fixed in time. Um, they are helpless. It may have the right bias in the sense of there are lots of aggressive people trying to dispossess them of their lands and eradicate their culture. Um, but the way in which the pioneers are described um, as creating something out of uh, the, the, the crackers, I probably shouldn't call them pioneers, uh, but how, how this cracker culture is portrayed um, does a real disservice to the role that Seminoles had in that time period. Um, much of what we see in the land um, remembered isn't really about, um, how does that, it isn't just tensions between Seminoles and non-Seminoles. Much of what allowed pioneers and settlers to come in and make a life in the interior of Florida was because Seminoles were cooperating with them um, for purposes of their own. Seminoles initiated trade, Seminoles had, were cattle people. Um, and Alamis Remembered tries to get us to reimagine that world better than perhaps what we remembered it beforehand, um, but not quite the way that I think is true to how Seminoles lived and understood the world around them. I hope that gets to, the, to your question, that's all. It's a big question, especially for people who haven't read the book. Thanks. Um, Marilyn asks, are the chickies from 1834 a type that was common in pre-contact times or just what it had become by then? Okay, so in South Florida, around the time of contact and a little bit before that, the homes that were built on the east coast of Florida and what we say is now Miami um, would have been circular in shape. Um, so it doesn't look anything like either of those. Um, the Calusa had some circular, but also some square shaped. We don't know what they actually look like, right? So these are, it's made out of wood and branches. Um, so, and the Spanish who describe them, describe them much more, they use words that would translate to huts. Um, so we don't know, they don't describe facts, they don't get a sense of size. Archaeologists can tell us how far apart the post holes are, um, but not how the walls were created or not created. So the Chiquis that we see in 1834 are much closer to what in North Florida William Bartram saw in the 1770s and what James Oglethorpe would have seen maybe two generations before that in Georgia. Um, Right, so Bartram talks about there being two-story homes um, where not two stories as we imagine it, but one of the stories would have been a place to store corn, um, nice and cool to keep it dry. 
so the, the floors would have been raised. Uh, but my understanding uh, is that these chickies that we see in 1834 are much closer to what the creeks would have been using at least for a few generations before that. Going much further back than that is much harder to kind of discern, uh, in part because the, the people who are Creek, their ancestors in 1500 weren't Creek and they were living these large chiefdoms um, and housing structures would have been very different, um, bigger um, and, and actually in different areas. So kind of making those connections from generation to generation is hard. Um, much easier to say, if we start our timeline in 1760, maybe next time I should use Bartram, um, at least his, his written description. It does look like this, the Creeks and the folks in North Florida are using one thing, and that by some point, the folks in South Florida are neither using what was there beforehand um, or using uh, what may have been brought in. Maybe it's a hybrid of them both. Um, but we don't know why. Interesting. Um, let's see. Um, Rick asks, do the Seminole trace their lineage back to Florida's early indigenous cultures like the Timucua, Appalachia, et cetera, or to tribes like the Creek or both? Both. Um, and I think it also depends on which Seminole you ask. There are, there are Seminole tribal members, especially those from the Brighton Reservation that know not just like in their heart, but they could, do, they could do the genealogy out loud for you, what Red Stick Creek family they descend from. And they have family stories that can tie them to a civil war that the Creeks fought in 1812, 13, 14. And they know like that's their story, that's their lineage. Um, there are others who say that some of their ancestry are Calusa or Tocobago or, or Tequesta. Um, how they as a community describe where they come from, increasingly it is both. Um, they know that their ancestors um, pick a year, whatever, a few hundred years ago would never have called themselves Seminole. They would have gone by many other names. They know that they were not a coherent one group with a different name staying the same one group. They know that they have lots of different um, ancestors um, from across the native South. And enough of them believe, um, and I think the evidence is pretty good that their, their ancestors are indigenous Floridians. Um, now, most of those indigenous Floridian populations were devastated. So we're not talking about tens of thousands of Tequesta surviving, um, but rather dozens of Calusa and Tequesta. Um, so that's, so both, there you go. Yeah. Um... Are there certain seminal customs that can be traced to the creeks um, or to, to pre-Florida roots? So I think the green corn ceremony is probably the most important. Um, so corn doesn't grow very well in the wetlands of Florida. It's right, that's not a, a, a crop that would have traditionally been grown there and it wasn't grown there by um, the peoples that we see in ancient Florida. Corn is something that is brought in as an import and the green corn ceremony is the single most important ceremony for the native South as a whole. So Creeks, Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, and uh, Choctaws. And so as these Creeks move in, they maintain the green corn ceremony. Um, and to, I believe, I'm not hundred percent positive about this, but I believe the dances um, at the green corn ceremony are all chanted in Muscogee Creek, um, not Miccosukee. And so the Muscogee Creek language, I believe, would have been one of the things that migrated in as well. So there's certainly, um, say, multiple voices. We think about where their ancestors come from. Um, how that process takes place is beyond my knowledge, uh, but there's certainly um, clues that we can see. Certain clans certainly also have roots outside of Florida, um, and certain clans probably have roots inside Florida. Yeah, a very complex um, process of becoming who they are today. Um, okay, where are we at here? This I'm not sure this might have been answered in another question, but I'll go ahead and throw it out there just in case. Um, how many Calusa and Tocobago or, or others um, were still around when the Creeks moved into Florida? Oh, I wish I had an answer for that one. Um, <laughs> so this is what we know. We don't have, we don't, we don't have a number. Um, I would say more than a dozen, less than a hundred is my, 
for each of those groups. Mm -hmm. We do know that it is widely told by historians and anthropologists that Florida is emptied because there was a document written by the Spanish when they evacuated the missions in the 1700s, they said they cleared out all of the missions. When it got translated into English, they left out basically the phrase of the missions, we cleared out all the Indians. Um, in this early 1700s, a similar type of, uh, not quite translation, but there was a slave raid into the interior of Florida. And Thomas Nairn said, we not, his words were, we knifed all the Indians, none were left. And then he had his, someone with him draw a map and he drew a map precisely where he went and about 30 miles south of where he went, the, the map maker wrote many villages. Um, so like they went pretty far south into the interior of Florida. They took as many slaves as they possibly could. They went home and they said, we are done, indicating that there'd be a lot of work to get the handful who were left um, or whatever was left. Um, so we don't know. Um, this is not something that I don't, and I think this is one of those questions that we wish we can get an answer to. Um, but I think this is gonna be elusive, at least with the methods that we have today. I don't think we'll ever have an answer for that. Um, how different are the Seminole living out West? Do they have distinctly different customs? So patchwork is different. Origin stories are different. Um, language has evolved slightly differently. Green corn ceremony is pretty similar, although Seminoles out West, I'm, um, I'm going to forget, but Seminoles out West at green corn ceremony go one direction around the fire and in Florida, they go the other direction. Um, Buffalo Tiger writes about this in his memoir because he was invited out, he was a Miccosukee elder and he was invited to go out to um, Oklahoma and, and dance. And he was startled by that they were going the wrong way, but he was unaware that the Seminoles decided to go the other way in commemoration of removal. Um, right, so he saw it at first as something that was, they're doing it the wrong way rather than intentionally different. Um, but there are also lots of similarities. Um, increasingly Seminoles in Oklahoma and Florida are, um, they acknowledge each other as kin, um, even though they're of different nations. Um, and sometimes, well, so in politics it's not part of it and the resources aren't part of it. Um, there's increasingly more cultural sharing going on between them. Um, okay, and then um, we have uh, one last question, which is probably going to be just about perfect for our time frame. Um, someone just asked if you could just tell us a little bit about um, the languages spoken by the Seminole people. So the Seminole speak two languages. Um, so, well, in addition to English or Spanish or whatever other languages they would like, two indigenous languages. Um, the most spoken language is Miccosukee, which is of a Hitchiti origin. Um, that is say the Big Cypress, the Hollywood, and most other communities in Florida. And Muskogee Creek um, is spoken at what is the Brighton Reservation. Um, now, most Seminoles who speak one also speak English. English is kind of a ling lingua franca. That's a language that they do most of their council work in, in part because it's a bilingual community. It's important to know, I think, though, that uh, Miccosukee and Muskogee Creek are remarkably distinct from one another. There are different rules for grammar, different vocabulary. It's not like Spanish and Portuguese where you can kind of fake it if you know the other. Um, so uh, my language skills is remarkably weak, but I can give you one good example to hear the difference. Um, thank you in Creek or, or Muskogee Creek is Muro, um, and in Miccosuke it's Shonabish. It's not, it's not close. Yeah. Right? It's not, um, <laughs> And I've asked lots of people over the years if they knew anyone who spoke both languages fluently. And I've only had one name given to me. Um, so it, it is not something that happens very, very often. Um, yeah, and I, I was actually going to, if, if you hadn't answered it, I was going to follow up with that and ask how distinctive they were. So that's interesting. That's uh, good to know. Um, so that is the end of our questions. We have just a couple minutes left. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Dr. Frank, before I close this out? No, I'm good. Um, I guess here, let me I'll add one thing. Why not? Um, well, we, it, I think it ties together with how many people were here beforehand and where do they come from? Do they see themselves as the Kessler? Do they see themselves as Creek? Um, I think the way of understanding language is really helpful. 
that there are these two mutually unintelligible languages in one community. Um, and that reservation life, right? People who live at Big Cyprus um, are really proud of the fact that they are, that's where, the, that's where their family is from and equally so Brighton. And it's not that they hate one another, right? But there are tensions or mutual forms of pride that coexist within this tribal nation. Um, and it can be seen in the language and they tell stories differently um, and perhaps even have built homes differently over the years. 